Welcome to English 4E. This is class 21. And today we're going to be working on assignment K27. Um, oh, this is not writing a character sketch. This is actually going to be uh, working on um, working on our summary, writing our biography, basically. Okay, sorry, I realized I didn't change the title there. Uh, this is Julian Percy. And here are the ways to reach me. You can get me on Facebook and YouTube at capital G, capital P, E, R, C, Y, space, capital W, A, H, S, A. You can also email me at julian.percy at nnecschools.org. Um, you can send assignments to studentwork at nnec.on.ca. Always include your name, your course, your assignment number, and name. Okay, today's work. We're going to understand the format of a biography understand how to find reliable resources for internet research, understand bias and how it can affect reporting and information, understand political spectrum. What do left, right, and middle mean in politics? Look at Farley Mowat, suggest possible resources to read or listen to in order to know more about him, discuss possible search terms to use to look up information on him, understand how to prioritize and summarize in relationship to internet research and how to use these skills when writing a biography. Okay, so activity two is about Never Cry Wolf, which is a very uh, famous book written by Farley Mowat. Uh, Farley Mowat is one of Canada's most well-known writers whose work often draws attention to damage to nature by people and government policies regarding the treatment of endangered species of animals. One of Mr. Mowat's novels is called Never Cry Wolf. Okay, so key question number 27, research and response. As you can see, here's a wonderful picture of Farley Mowat. Using the internet or even an older encyclopedia at your learning center, you are to do a little bit of research on Farley Mowat. You are to find information about where and when he was born, his interests, his career as a writer, including the names of some of his works, his accomplishments and recognition, and anything else you would like to include. Your response will be approximately one half of a page handwritten in paragraph format or whatever the equivalent is as a computer printout. It is assumed that you'll be writing a rough copy that should then be revised and edited. However, you only need to actually submit your final copy. Okay, just to kind of get us going so we sort of all know what what he's about. This is a Heritage Minute on Farley Mowat. I don't know if you've ever seen these before. Kind of little tiny um, Canadian commercials on famous moments and famous people in Canadian history. Let's see. Let's all load up. Farley Mowat was born in 1921 in Belleville, Ontario. Starting at the age of 13, he regularly published a column Ooh. in the Star Phoenix based on his observations of birds in Saskatoon. Right. At age, we will try going right to the source and see if it works better that way. My apologies, because it kind of is kind of kind of cool there. All right, Heritage Minute. Farley Mo. But I don't know why that happens sometimes. Now, if it doesn't Grammarly work here, now uses know, AI just, to help you write, wrong. not just They've updated a Zoom. Type prompt and generate a persuasive okay. So they put some of the things in different spots. Farley Mowat was born in 1921 in so. Belleville, Ontario. Starting at the Even age of 13, he regularly sure published a column in the Star Phoenix based on his option sure sound. and helped the government solve oh, the that's disappointing. Okay. Well, I apologize if you get a chance to take a look at it. This kind of gives you a quick overview of him and what his life is about, which is kind of nice. And then this was an initial scene from Never Cry Wolf. A lot of his books also got turned into movies later on. And they had a lot of impact, not only on Canadians, but actually people around the world. It's kind of interesting. So let's say you were going to go do uh, some internet research on Farley Mowat. If I just enter Farley Mowat into the search engine, 
here is what initially comes up. You see some pictures of him, a little Facebook link, which is kind of funny because he was definitely pre-Facebook. He was born May 12th, 1921 in Belleville. Um, died May 6th, 2014. Here are some of his books, a little tiny information about him. And then the Wikipedia article, which Wikipedia is always there. Then if I look a little farther down on that page, here's also what comes up. We've got some um, bookstores because, of course, he's a novelist. So what comes up initially is places to buy his books. Those, those aren't going to be very helpful websites to learn more about his life. However, the next couple of entries look kind of promising. We've got the New York Times article, um, probably written when he died as an obituary. So that might be kind of interesting. And then we've got the Canadian Encyclopedia. It looks like they might have an article. Uh, because that's specifically Canadian-based, it might have more relevant information or be more in-depth. I want to kind of have a quick discussion about Wikipedia because it's it shows up almost always first. It, the internet always grabs it. Um, but you never want to make Wikipedia your only internet resource. And that's for several reasons. First, Wikipedia is known to have an open editing function, which means... Um, multiple people can edit it. Unfortunately, what that also means is that its information is not always truly reliable. It can be hard to know whether it is reliable information or not if you're not already familiar with the subject. So two, if you're going into college, they usually don't allow you to quote from Wikipedia, and I want you to develop the habit of avoiding it as a mean resource. Three, it's only one source. I do find sometimes people will over rely on it and just quote things from there. If you make sure to use multiple sources, it makes it more clear. Your work will include multiple viewpoints and a wide variety of information. Um, the most useful thing about Wikipedia is that at the bottom of their articles, they will provide links to all the places they got their information from. And that can be a rich treasure trove of resources to kind of wade through. Because the internet is so vast, it can be kind of hard to sort out what resources are reliable and which ones are not. It's kind of an ongoing issue. I just kind of wanted to tackle it while we're doing a, a research project. Okay, so we know that um, there's an, in, an article in the New York Times. Now, how do we know whether New York Times is considered a reliable resource? Well, there are a couple of places I can check. One possibility is to look at its reputation for reliability from an outside source. Reliability in a media source is based on a number of factors. So first of all, do they deliberately print news they know is false? If yes, if they do, then obviously they're completely unreliable because they're not even bothering to try. Do they deliberately print news they haven't checked for truthfulness? If yes to that, then they're also unreliable because they're not bothering to check. So it could be true, but you don't know because they, it's not a criteria for them. Do they share the source of their information when it will not put the source at risk? If yes, then there's a greater chance that they're reliable. But you may need to check that their source is reliable and trustworthy. If the president of the United States declares that the country's about to go to war with, with China, well, he's the leader of the country and therefore would know. If Joe Schmo, who owns a business selling shoes but has no links to the government or the army announce it, announces it, it is probably not reliable as he's not a trusted source. So just naming the source isn't always the only thing. Are their sources reliable? Media that consistently report false news are completely unreliable. Media that consistently don't check their facts are also unreliable. They may be telling the truth, but you have no way of knowing because they don't care about it. Media that won't share their sources, if they just say um, unnamed sources, they're also unreliable because you've maybe kind of checking out whether their sources are valid and trustworthy. Media sources that are trustworthy will not print fake news. They will check for truthfulness. They will report their sources and they will use reliable and valid sources for their information. Okay, great. But how does the average person know all this information about the different media sources? Well, there are some places that monitor this type of thing and they publish their results. So here's a very famous um, infographic 
and it's called the media bias chart. And if you look down this left side, you can see the summary of how reliable each resource is generally considered. So at the top is considered like high reliability with high levels of fact reporting and other and original fact finding. Original fact finding means that the reporters have actually investigated, they've gone, they've looked into it and they confirmed that's been is actually true. They haven't just relied on somebody's say so, they've gone over to look themselves. So that's the kind of thing where um, like a war reporter would actually be over where the war is happening and be able to report whether what um, you know what officials are saying about the war and what's actually happening on the ground are in fact the same. Um, in the middle are media that state a lot of opinion or analysis. Now, opinion and analysis is not necessarily wrong. It's just that it may be questionable and some media sources don't make it clear that it's their opinion and that can be confusing to people. And then down here at the bottom are media attempts, media sources where the reports may be completely made up, completely fabricated. So if I was looking at something like how reliable is the National Enquirer considered, well, it is way down here at the bottom, contains inaccurate or fabricated info. I don't know if you've seen the National Enquirer. They, they tend to publish stories like, you know, alien baby with three heads just discovered, born to 95-year-old mother, that kind of thing. Like, it's really out there, wacky kind of stuff. What about New York Post? Well, New York Post is over here in this little tiny red corner. And... They're kind of in the middle. They have a high analysis, high variation in reliability. So it sounds like sometimes reliable, sometimes not. New York Times, the other one, it sounds almost the same, right? It's two different newspapers from New York City, but they aren't the same. New York Times is way up here and is in the spot where it talks about fact reporting. So New York Times is much more reliable than, say, New York Post and way more reliable than National Enquirer. Now, obviously, this is um, an infographic of some of the major media. Not every single uh, media source is going to be on here. We're not going to find Sue Bolton on here. But if you go to Ad Fonts Media Company, they have more information there on different media sources and they'll cover more. Again, not everything, there's just too many papers out there but they do cover a lot of the major things. So if you check across the top of the chart, across the top, it talks about media bias or political bias of these media sources. So what do they mean by bias? And they've got like most extreme left, hyperpartisan left, skews left, middle, skews right, hyperpartisan right, most extreme right. But what do those terms, right, left, and middle, actually mean in politics? Because like, that makes a difference. Like, you're looking at that as to how reliable they are. Well, what does that mean? So all human beings have some bias. And since a media source is made up of human beings, it's going to express some of that bias. But what is bias? So one dictionary defined bias as a type of prejudice, meaning a strong inclination of the mind, or a perceived opinion about something or someone. So a bias may be favorable or unfavorable. Bi bias in favor of or against an idea. It may sound like it's automatically bad, but it's not necessarily the case. So people might have a bias towards good things like telling the truth or caring for others. Our political bias is a slightly different thing. Political beliefs or opinions are often presented on a spectrum. There's a group in the middle, supposedly, and then groups to the right of that, and then to the left of that. And usually there's like a little line here, and people could be anywhere along this spectrum. So the important thing to notice though, is that it's all relative. Different countries and different time periods have had the different average or middle positions. So right and left are always in relationship to that particular country in one particular time period. Like, so somebody, who's on the right wing in Canada might hold very different views than somebody who's in the right wing in America or somebody who's on the right wing of Saudi Arabia because there's different issues going on in different countries. 
So it doesn't mean a certain set specific type of belief. It's always in relationship to what's going on in the middle, okay? Opinions on things such as women's rights, war conscription, welfare, schools, they've all changed drastically over the years in different countries. So what are the origins? How did the terms left and right come into play? Well, the story begins in France um, in the summer of 1789, explains Patrice Higonot, a professor emeritus of French history at Harvard University. As the French Revolution gained steam, an angry mob had just stormed the Bastille. The National Assembly assembled to act as the revolution's government, and the assembly had a principal goal, writing a new constitution. So basically, the um, French peasants and middle classes decided to overthrow the government, which was uh, a monarchy, and they needed to write basically the laws or the constitution for the new country. One of the main issues that the assembly debated was how much power the king should have. Um, would he have the right to an absolute veto? Veto is when you say like, okay, this is the law that's been proposed and we're all in favor of it. But if one person says no, like the king or the prime minister or a president, then that law doesn't go through. So as the debate continued, those who thought the king should have an absolute veto sat on the right of the president of the assembly. And those who thought he should not, which was a more radical view at the time, sat on the left of the president of the assembly. So in other words, those who wanted to stick closer to tradition were on the right, and those who wanted more change were on the left. And then those terms have carried over through the years. In general, those who are considered left-wing would be favoring more change to what's happening in the government. And those in the right are favoring less change. Sometimes it might be like more control versus less control as well, okay? And this can become connected to very specific political issues of the day. So for example, if you favored more gun control, you might be thought of as automatically left-wing. And if you favored less control, you may be automatically thought of right-wing. Sometimes people will assume that if you hold a certain stance, on one issue, and then you hold that same stance on all issues. So in other words, if you're right wing on this one issue of gun control, maybe you're right wing on all issues. Now that's not necessarily the case, but lots of time people will make that assumption. This is a long winded way to explain what's meant by right or left. And I'm saying that because it's a little bit tricky to define it. You can't just say it's in terms of one issue because there's all sorts of issues and they can all be very different, right? But thinking about that, um, what bias might a source like the New York Times have? So if you look here to see where it falls, it skews a little bit left, it says. So it's not quite in the middle. It's kind of more on the favor of some change. Whereas a group such as um, Occupy Democrats, where is that? There they are. They're kind of over here in the hyper-partisan left. So they would want a lot of change, which makes sense. Occupy Democrats is that group that was like uh, camping out on the lawns and trying to get things to change. So on the other hand, uh, media sources like Forbes, BBC, CBS, those are kind of all characterized as being in the middle or average. And then on the right, we've got things like Fox News, uh, Washington Times. Some of these aren't ones I know of or that we're really going to look at, but they're in the hyperpartisan right. Why is this even important? Like, what does it matter? Well, due to bias, some media may leave out information, underplay information, or exaggerate information that reflects their political leanings. And it can be done both consciously and unconsciously. So when researching something controversial, it can be a good idea to try and read articles from both sides of the political spectrum to know what information is being manipulated. So even in a, in a situation like this, like we're looking up information on a famous person, but because he may have had political leanings himself, different people may have very different responses to him. So um, 
he would be considered fairly left wing. So somebody on the right might have a very different opinion of him than someone on the left, and you might get very different information depending on your source. And that's true really of any political figure, right? And it's just going to be mindful of when you're reading information, why, um, you know, one article might present somebody very favorably and why another article might pre present somebody in a very unfavorable light. Okay, so for information on historical figures like Farley Mowat, we may want to look specifically at sites that promote knowledge of Canadian history. I can try adding that to my search terms. So I just don't want to only put um, Farley Mowat because what happens is you'll get the 30,000 search terms or results and people generally only want to look at the first four or five. But if you're more specific with your search terms, then sometimes you'll get more targeted or more useful information. So other possible search terms might be things like historical importance of Farley Mowat, literary importance of Farley Mowat, criticism of Farley Mowat, influence of Farley Mowat. So different things that came up, I had a, an article on Farley Mowat in the Canadian Encyclopedia. There's an entire documentary on Far Farley Mowat. There is a very interesting interview with Farley Mowat. Um, a critique on his reliability and truthfulness, which is really interesting. Um, a look at his writing style, and then a review of his controversial book, Never Cry Wolf. Okay, so we may come back to this page at the end if we have some time to look at some of these articles. So basically, you're doing all this research to be able to write a short biography or a summary of Farley Mowat's life and work. So biographies generally start with information regarding parents, place of birth, date of birth, siblings, and anything crucial about that early time period, like the death of a parent or a move to another country. Um, a longer biography might go into details about their childhood and their school. A shorter biography doesn't need to unless it was a major influence on their life and work. So like if they went to a school and hated it and then vowed to wipe out schools, for example, giving you kind of a crazy example, then that would be important to mention because it was a major influence. Anything major that influenced their work is usually mentioned. And that might include things like world events, such as like wars or famines, mentors, friends, or enemies who helped or harmed them in their work, major social or political movements, things like women's rights, civil rights, the rise of communism, all those kind of things could have major effects on people. Um, also major life experiences, marriage, children, disease, sickness, financial disasters, successes, awards, important jobs. Generally, this is all put in chronological order. They usually kind of follow from birth to death, step by step. That's kind of an important part to keep in mind. So when you're doing this, you're going to be reading a bunch of different stuff. You're going to have to work on prioritizing because prioritizing is a it's a major research skill, right? Whenever you're trying to decide what to put into a biography, you're gonna be prioritizing. And it simply means that you're thinking about what is important or like what is a priority and should be included. And part of this is gonna depend on how much space you have. So if you're writing an entire novel, you're gonna prioritize a lot more than someone writing a magazine article than us where we're only writing a half page. With a shorter space to write in, you need to make sure to include what are they most famous for? How are they most important or influential? What's the big thing that they're known for that they've influenced? What did they change? Is there a lasting impact from their work or their life? So for example, it'd be really weird to write a biography on Abraham Lincoln and not mention that he was the president who began the Civil War and helped secure freedom from slavery for the black people, right? However, that is a famous figure we all know about. Everybody knows that about him. When you're researching someone we haven't heard of, one thing to look for is what facts are mentioned repeatedly by multiple people in multiple different articles. And when you see those facts, you're gonna understand that, that that's the important thing. That's the people, the part that everybody's remembering and that you probably should mention in your biography. 
Now, often the writers will make it really obvious with their phrasing, right? They may say things like, Ned Brown, who is best known for, you know, being a tobacco uh, company uh, activist, or Jane Montgomery, who was most influential in uh, changing women's politics, or uh, Pierre Degas, who is famous for whatever he's famous for. So they usually will, well, a lot of times, will state what they're well known for. Okay. Prioritizing is also important when deciding what facts to mention in a summary of their life. Well, I gave you kind of a short list of possible areas to look at. Every person is different. So one person's place of birth may have had a profound effect on their life. So for example, a Jewish person born during the time period of the Nazis in Germany, that would have had a profound influence on their life, right? They would have been persecuted, imprisoned, maybe tortured, maybe killed. But for another person where they were born may not seem to matter much at all, right? It really depends. The same goes for areas like school, family, friends, children. The thing to look for in trying to decide what to mention and what to leave out is, was what you're looking at a huge priority or huge influence on the person you're writing about? Did a crippling disease affect your outlook? Or an abusive father? Or extreme poverty? What affected them the most, either for good or for bad? Those are the things you want to make sure we include. Again, we only have a half page. It's not really a lot to write a biography on someone who was alive for as long as he did and did as much um, writing and had as much influence. So summarizing is another important research skill and kind of part of prioritizing. It can be really tempting when you're doing internet research or any kind of research to just write down every single fact you find. But trying to sort out which facts are important, that's what we just kind of looked at, right? That's the prioritizing part. But summarizing is related to it because when you're looking at a large quantity of information, summarizing is when you try to simplify the important points of it. It also tries to show the connections or the sequences in a clear way. How much we summarize also depends on the amount of room we have to write or the size of our basket, as it were. All the food in the grocery store may be good, but we don't have room for it all in our basket. All the facts about Farley Mowat may be interesting, but they won't all fit on our half page. Okay, so um, I'm going to acknowledge right here, I think summarizing is a hard skill. It is. It's hard to look at a whole bunch of information and decide, hey, what's important? What's not important? What should I leave in? What should I leave out? So we're going to kind of go through some of the most common mistakes. The biggest one is writing down the first five or ten facts you discover or read and then just stopping abruptly. So let's say I was reading an article on Abraham Lincoln's life and it was discussing his early years. And I dutifully copy down the information in my own words and then stop when my half page of writing is done. They are finished. Oops, maybe not. Because depending on how far back the article goes, you may not have even gotten to Abraham Lincoln's adulthood or his presidency or his important role in the Civil War. When you summarize, you can't just write down whatever you read first and assume it's the most important. It can't just be any, you know, half page on him. It has to be a half page of the most important things. So you want to make sure you've got the big picture of his or her life from birth to death. So you know you have the most important facts down and can help give a shortened timeline of his life in your summary. If your summary stops in the middle of the person's life, then a lot of facts may be missing. Sometimes famous people might make new contributions to their field or to their country, even at a very old age. So like Grandma Moda, Moses, who's a very famous artist, did not really get started painting until she was like 78 years old. So if you just talked about her early years, you would never even get to the part that made her famous. Laura Ingall, Ingall Wilder, sorry, I'm tripping over how to say that, did not become famous for her writing until she was in her 60s. She's the one that wrote things like um, Little House in the Big Woods, Little House in the Prairie, all those kind of books. So if the person you're writing about has died, please make sure to notice what's happened in the later years of their life 
even if it's just something brief, like retired with their husband while making occasional guest presentations around the country or lived a quiet life or continued to stay involved in politics, just kind of mention, because often what happens is um, people's lives are kind of like a mountain, right? So there'll be stuff that leads up to important points and then a high point and then a part where things may not be as important, but you still want to kind of mention something so that people kind of know how the person ended their life, basically. Okay, common summarizing mistake number two, copying sentences word for word from your source. So let's say I was reading an article on Abraham Lincoln's life and it was discussing his early years and I dutifully copied down the information word for word or I just picked selected sentences to write down. Great job, right? Um, No, yeah, that's called plagiarism. And it's when you write down someone else's words, uh, put in the wrong spot there, someone else's words, and act as if they're your own. What you want to do instead is look for the facts about the person and then put those facts into your own sentences. So one way to do this is instead of just looking at the article and trying to write your um, summary, just look at the article, is take another step first. Instead, make some quick jot notes of what you read instead of trying to write your own rough draft. It's really hard to develop your sense of how to put things when there's already a sentence right there in front of you. Whereas if you're going from jot notes, it can be much easier. It sounds like it's more work, but it actually ends up being less work in the long run. Let me kind of show you what I mean. Okay, so here's the first part of a Wikipedia article on Abraham Lincoln. All the little spots where it's underlined is where it would flip to another article in uh, the Wikipedia. And I'm, I'm using Wikipedia just because it's it's an, an easy one to, to do, I'm not because I'm necessarily the most reliable one. Um, so here's what it says. Lincoln was born into poverty in a log cabin in Kentucky and was raised on the frontier, primarily in Indiana. He was self-educated and became a lawyer, Whig party leader, Illinois state legislator, and U.S. representative from Illinois. In 1849, he returned to his successful law practice in Springfield, Illinois. In 1854, he was angered by the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which opened the territories to slavery, causing him to re-enter politics. He soon became a leader of the new Republican Party. He reached a national audience in the 1858 Senate campaign debates against Stephen A. Douglas. Lincoln ran for president in 1860, sweeping the North to gain victory. Pro-slavery elements in the South viewed his election as a threat to slavery, and Southern states began seceding from the nation. During this time, the newly formed Confederate States of America began seizing military bases in the South. A little over one month after Lincoln assumed the presidency, Confederate forces attacked Fort Sumter, a U.S. fort in South Carolina. So now if I try to go through this sentence by sentence and put it in my own words, I'm not really summarizing. I'm, what, I'm doing what's called paraphrasing, and it's actually harder to do. So I start at the beginning. Uh, Lincoln was born into poverty in a log cabin in Kentucky and was raised on the fr frontier, primarily in Indiana. Uh, so I've written instead, Abraham Lincoln was born poor in a cabin in Kentucky. I, I have changed it, but it sounds an awful lot the same, doesn't it? He grew up in the in, on the Indiana frontier. He educated himself. He became a lawyer, a Whig party leader, an Illinois state legislator, and U.S. representative from Illinois. So all of a sudden, I ended up kind of plagiarizing because I couldn't think of how to put the last sentence in any different words. It all seemed really important. And if you read it, it comes off very stiff and kind of wooden and not very um, not very lyrical, not very uh, good writing, basically. But I can read the same article and just make some quick jot notes. And here, I'm just trying to notice what's important. So I'm just trying to prioritize. Born in Kentucky, lived in Indiana, lawyer, party leader, state legislator, 
federal Illinois rep. 1949, restarted his law practice. 1854, upset by Kansas-Nebraska Act. The new territories are to have slaves now. 1860, ran for president. Triggered southern states to succeed. So if I actually look at what information I've got from here, I actually need a little bit more information. They've been so, they're just hitting the highlights They've included a lot of events, but without a lot of explanation, which actually makes it harder for me to summarize, basically because they've already summarized so much, right? So in this case, I might need to look for another source and add more information to my jot notes before I begin writing. That's what we're talking about using multiple sources is if you're trying to write from just one source, it actually is harder. So I grabbed another article and this one was more focused on um, his early years. Okay. So I read it and I look at it for information. And I think as I'm reading it, what is most important? As a kid, was there anything that was super important that I want to mention in my biography? So let's read this and kind of find out. Hang on a second. Okay. Abraham Lincoln, born February 12th, 1809, near Hodginville, Kentucky, U.S., died April 15th, 1865, Washington, D.C., was the 16th president of the United States, 1861 to 65, who preserved the Union during the American Civil War and brought about the emancipation, which is the freeing of enslaved people in the United States. Um, now, there's a, I put these ellipses here. I didn't need this many, but I just kind of put it there um, to show that there's a big chunk I kind of skipped over. In December 1816, faced with a lawsuit challenging the title to his Kentucky farm, title means like the ownership, Thomas Lincoln, who is Abraham Lincoln's father, moved with his family to southwestern Indiana. There as a squatter on public land, he hastily put up a half-faced camp, a crude structure of logs and bows, bows with one side open to the weather in which the family took shelter behind a blazing fire. Soon he built a permanent cabin, and later he bought the land on which it stood. Abraham helped to clear the fields and to take care of the crops, but early acquired a dislike for hunting and fishing. In after years, he recalled the panther's scream, the bears that preyed on the swine, and the poverty of Indiana frontier life, which was pretty pinching at times. The unhappiest period of his boyhood followed the death of his mother in the autumn of 1818. As a ragged nine-year-old, he saw her buried in the forest, then faced a winter without the warmth of a mother's love. Fortunately, before the onset of a second winter, Thomas Lincoln brought home from Kentucky a new wife for himself and a new mother for the children. Sarah Bush Johnston Lincoln, a widow with two girls and a boy of her own, had energy and affection to spare. She ran the household with an even hand, treating both sets of children as if she had borne them all, but she was especially fond of Abraham and he of her. He afterward referred to her as his angel mother. And this is from the Britannica. Okay, so now I've, been, I've got some more information. The bottom part I haven't really changed. I've just added some more information about his early life. Born in Kentucky on February 12th, 1809. Died April 15th, 16th president, lived in Indiana with his mother and father, very poor, house growing up was a half-faced camp or a half of a cabin. Abraham helped farm, but he didn't like fishing or hunting. Mom died in 1818. Dad got remarried to Sarah Lincoln, who had two girls and a boy of her own. Okay, so now I take my, my jot notes, and now I kind of, it's a little bit easier because I'm not looking at someone else's writing. I'm just looking at my own notes, which just makes it so much easier for me to put into my own year, own ideas, my own words, right? So here's what I've got. Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12th, 1809 in Kentucky. They moved to Indiana when he was very young and grew up so poor, they didn't even have a whole house, just a sort of half cabin at first. He helped to farm and clear the land they eventually built a proper cabin on. He didn't like growing up that poor, nor did he enjoy activities such as hunting and fishing that went with frontier life. His mom died in 1818 when he was only nine years old, but his dad got remarried the next year to a woman named Sarah. She had children of her own, two girls and one boy, 
and they all lived very well together. Abraham loved her very much. So because I took the time to put it into jot notes, I avoid the problem of um, plagiarizing. I also kind of, instead of trying to summarize and prioritize all at the same time, I've done the prioritizing by making the jot notes, and now I just have to summarize it and put it all together. So it's a little bit easier because I've split up the two steps instead of trying to do them both at once. Okay, summarizing mistake number three, trying to include too many details. This actually ties back into prioritizing. We don't want our writing to be so bare bones that it's boring to read, so we do need to add some details. For example, the fact that Abraham Lincoln grew up poor and working in the fields might be kind of an important detail because if he hadn't done that kind of hard labor, um, he probably has got more sympathy for the slaves who were doing that kind of labor themselves, right? Somebody who was born rich might not really understand what that experience was like and how hard it can be and how miserable it would be to be in that experience. So when choosing details to include, here are some things to think about. Is this detail important or does it help me understand something important about the character? Does it tie into why or how this person became famous? Does it help explain why this person is still relevant or important today? And does it make my writing more interesting? Okay. So even though we are writing a biographical sketch, we can still use good paragraph structure. It's common for writers to mention what the person they're writing about is famous for, even in the first sentence. It kind of gives the reader context that will help them understand the writing that follows. And again, part of this issue is certain names are really famous that everybody knows, like say George Washington. So people generally know who you're talking about there. But somebody who is not quite as famous, like there are some of the presidents in the United States. If you mentioned, I wouldn't know who they were, right? Or different types of singers or actresses or whatever. Um, so you can't assume that your reader knows the person you're writing about. So sometimes it can kind of help to give them an idea uh, right up at the beginning of here's what this person is important for. So for example, Muhammad Ali, famous both for his boxing, not boxes, boxing, <laughs> um, and his words of wisdom was born in Mother Teresa, known the world over for her charity work with the poor in India, was born to Marilyn Monroe, adored for her beauty, talent, and wit, was the child of. And so there's just kind of a quick synopsis of what they're most famous for. You also want to have a good closing sentence that summarizes your mini biography. You don't want to just stop writing abruptly because the person died, right? You want to tie up your writing with a great sentence that kind of highlights their importance. There are phrases like things like, this person will always be remembered for, although gone, their influence continues in, their efforts in this field created, the work they started is continued by, they would be proud to be remembered. Anything that kind of summarizes them, but sort of wraps it up in a concluding manner. Okay, once you've got your rough draft, remember that you need to go through and revise things. Remember the way you can revise things, add more information, remove unneeded elements, move it into a better order. Remember for a biography, we generally use chronological order and then substitute. Substitute is kind of like, um, uh, paraphrasing, putting things in your own words. It's a kind of an important part when you're doing this kind of summarizing. Okay. Also, remember to use transitional and introductory words and phrases to help create good flow and connections between your sentences. One thing to keep in mind as you're writing is to make your transitions from one sentence to the next very smooth for the reader. Because you're pulling from multiple sources and trying to stick to the facts, Sometimes writers forget to make, to keep using their creative writing skills to make things sound interesting. Also remember that transition phrases can help point out sequencing or connections or cause and effect. So here are some examples, like some that involve sequencing. Hang on a sec. After that time period, after that experience, Following this disappointment, frustration led to, finally, at last, eventually, gradually. And then you can go to phrases that 
suggest motivation, or suggest cause and effect. Due to this situation, he, because of this occurrence, he, this resulted in, this event spurred him on to, this experience created a passion for, his need of something developed from this event. This development led to him exploring. So you're kind of making the connections for your reader when you use these kind of phrases. You're helping them see um, the reasons and how things relate. So it's not just a collection of jumbled facts. They're the best facts that you've chosen to explain it. Um, this is a really lovely obituary I was going to share to kind of give you a head start with knowing him. I hope it, I don't know if it's going to work since we were having problems with sound earlier. Farley Mowat once said, without a function, we cease to be, so I will write until I die. And so he did, last night, the age of 92, still writing. Mowat's first book was debated in the House of Commons, the writings that followed indelibly etched into the minds of millions. His literary legacy, undeniable. He wrote about 40 books over the course of nearly 60 years. They've sold 17 million copies and have been translated into 52 languages. He's read and renowned the world over as a great storyteller, a humorist, and an environmentalist. Even those who've never read one of his yarns feel his cultural impact because in a way many Canadians are seeing their country through Mowat's eyes. Deanna Sumanak has that story. Farley Mowat loved Canada, wrote about it, and changed it. He was a fierce defender of the natural world. These were strongly emotional books that really taught us something about ourselves. Farley Mowat's books had power because he wrote about what he saw around him. Born in Ontario, he grew up in Saskatchewan, surrounded by the grandeur of the prairies and always the company of animals. Early family pets were the inspiration behind his children's books, popular to this day, The Dog Who Wouldn't Be and Owls in the Family. But at 22, Moet left all that behind. He joined the Allied invasion of Sicily during the Second World War. Then gradually the realization dawned that what we were in was not a game, it was not a soccer game, it was a game of slaughter and the slaughter would eventually get each of us if we stayed long enough. That experience shaped many of his battles in the years to come. Green Party leader Elizabeth May was a close friend. He certainly experienced in the Second World War in the Italy campaign the worst of brutality of human against human and he saw that same brutality of human against the natural world and he held us uh, in the balance as a, a species that was lacking in fundamental morality. Moet fought for the underdog, both human and animal. His account of the plight of a remote Inuit band, People of the Deer, sparked a national debate about Canada's policies in the Arctic. I encountered them, heard a little bit about their story, got to know them slightly, was appalled at what was happening to them. And what was happening to them was that they were, they were being extirpated, they were dying off. And he wrote about it and brought it alive. And so Canadians who've never been to the Arctic, for example, feel that the Arctic belongs to them. He says he spent a year living with a pack of Arctic wolves. The result, Never Cry Wolf, is credited with changing the image of the animal as a vicious predator, even with stopping wolf calls as far away as Russia. He also took aim at the seal hunt. But if moral outrage was Moet's fuel, some felt he relied on it a little too much. Many of his books were criticized over their factual accuracy. Farley had a great line that I don't think he in invented, but I use it all the time myself, which is never let the, the facts get in the way of the truth. And some of that was theater, but he was determined to express the stories as he saw them. As he saw them no matter what the consequence. The powers that be say, well, you can't preach and be a writer. I say... Moet continued writing about things that moved and outraged him for the rest of his life, proving to the world that Canadians are nice enough when they're nice, 
But when they're feisty, they're fascinating. Deanna Sumanak, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so I wanted to share that with you because it kind of gives you a little bit of an intro into some of the controversies surrounding Farley Mowat and gives you a starting point. We are going to be doing a few more assignments on Farley Mowat and his work. So I want you to be aware of what he's, what he's about. Um, if you have any questions about the assignment, feel free to message me. Thank you so much for joining us today. And let's say today is Thursday, so I will not be talking to you guys again until probably Monday, okay? Thank you, and let me know if you need help.